going to continue in Advent, and uh, last week, or I should say, yeah, last week, Mark started off Advent by explaining about the different calendars, and he went through it all, so I will not review that, but uh, he, he focused in on the Roman calendar that the Roman Catholics use, and that's going to be our Advent, which in Latin, it's Adventus, because the V's are pronounced W. I did take Latin in high school, took two years of Latin, so I got my Latin down. I took a year of, of Hebrew. I took a year of, uh, I'm sorry, one, two, three, two and a half semesters of Koine Greek and American Sign Language. I took a, about a year of American Sign Language. All of my languages that I've learned are all unspoken, all of them unspoken, which, which means I had no language labs. Uh, all, my, all my other friends were like going to the fourth hour having to speak their languages. I did not have to do that, so that was a smart move on my point. But um, he talked about Advent or Adventus, which is the arrival. And uh, he did a great job talking about the idea of Advent, about how God has a plan for our lives, general plans and specific plans uh, for each of our lives. You have, uh, as you read God's word, it talks about what God's will is for you to pray always, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, um, several other things throughout the scripture that explains what God's will is in a general sense. And then it's more specific. He has a a particular will and desire for each of you and for myself. And that's why we keep coming to church every week. That's why we keep reading our Bible every day, right? That's why we keep praying every day, right? It's because we want to be in contact with the one who is in control and who has a plan. And so it's it's a great opportunity that we have to know him, and to make him known in the world that we live in. So as Mark uh, was teaching, he talked about the three focuses of of what Advent means. So he didn't really get into the weeks of Advent. It's just the idea of what Advent is. So his first one was Christ's arrival in Bethlehem, which is what we're celebrating and counting down now, to the 25th, which is Jesus' birthday. It's not his official birthday because we don't know what that is. Birthdays were not celebrated in Scripture. Uh, Deaths were more uh, marked down, but births, they didn't make a big deal out of that, maybe because uh, a lot of kids would be born and died, and you just never know who was going to keep going. And so they didn't make a big deal. And uh, because we now make a big deal out of births, we tried to triangulate when it might have been. And, of course, there's a pagan holiday on the 25th. And um, the Romans were trying to get more people into the church. And so a lot of the politics entered into why we celebrate on December the 25th. The odds are that was not Jesus' birthday. But it's fun to have a day that we can celebrate. Three days after that is my birthday, the 28th. So you want to mark that down on your calendars as well. Because it's rough being a Christmas baby. Because, you know, God gets all the glory. <laughs> By the time it gets to me three days later, everyone is tired, out of money, and ready for the new year. So it was rough. So the first arrival that Mark talked about uh, last week is how Christ arrived in Bethlehem. The fulfillment of the prophecy, a really big deal. Uh, the second thing, the arrival in your life. For those of you who know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, specifically who have humbled yourselves Ask forgiveness of your sins, knowing that you can't do enough good to get into heaven and that you must rely on God who made a provision for you. And if you've accepted that free gift from God, then you have had an arrival into your life. If you've not, there's still time. There's still time for God to arrive into your heart, uh, just like I just explained, humbling yourself, asking forgiveness, and confessing the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Those who confess the Lord will be saved. The third arrival that has not yet come that, we're, that we are now awaiting is the arrival of Jesus' second coming. So those who had the second arrival here into your life, you'll get caught up into heaven and be able to live with him for all eternity at the second coming. If you happen to leave this earth before then, good news. As Christians, we don't go from death to death to life. We go from life to life. And where when we're absent from the body here, we are present with the Lord 
for those of us who have accepted him as our personal Lord and Savior, and we're able to live with him for all eternity, and we're going to talk more about that as we move on. But that's what Mark uh, went over last week. So today, I want to just hit the liturgical part of week one and week two. We have our Advent wreath right here, and I'm going to just read through a liturgy that that I kind of arranged. I didn't really write it, but I arranged it about three years ago. And um, this will give us a chance to catch up on the first two candles of Advent. Um, and in it, there's a place that it'll have dark print that says response. Everything's on the screen. So if you see anything in dark, bold print, that means you read that with me. The other parts I'll read, uh, some scripture and some prayers. And we're going to go, we're going to work through the first two and then I'll spend the, the remainder of the class talking about the emphasis of week two, which is this week, and it is the peace of God, all right? Does that make sense? Okay, so just follow along with me, and uh, we'll participate together in this liturgy of Advent that, uh, of course, Baptists, we're not big into liturgical things, so like Mark said last week, we're going to bring it to you, and uh, he'll continue on next week. So here we start with the liturgy of the first two litur uh, Advent candles. The introduction starts like this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. Very good. Now if you practice, you'll be able to get better as we go. Anything bold print, you're going to read it with me. Here we go. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. O come, all ye faithful. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Here's a reading from the Old Testament, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who lived in a land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest, as they extol when dividing the spoils. For the yoke of the burden, uh, for the yoke that burdened them, the pole on their shoulder, the rod of their taskmaster, you have smashed as on the day of Midian. For every boot that trampled in battle, every cloak rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. Upon his shoulders dominion rests. They name him Wonderful Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. His dominion is vast and forever peaceful. Upon David's throne and over his kingdom, which he confirms and sustains, by judgment and justice. Read that right. His throne, over David's throne and over his kingdom, which he confirms and sustains by judgment and justice, both now and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. And here's our prayer. Our Lord God, we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. He is Emmanuel, the hope of the peoples. He is the wisdom that teaches and guides us. He is the Savior 
of every nation. Lord God, let your blessing come upon us as we light the candle of this wreath. May the wreath and its light be a sign of Christ's promise of bringing salvation. May he come quickly and not delay. We ask this through Christ our Lord. O come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of humankind. Bid every sad division cease and bid, I'm sorry, and be thyself our Prince of Peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. Here is the first candle. The first candle of Advent is the prophecy's candle. So the prophet's candle who prophesies. It symbolizes hope as Israel waited patiently for the coming Messiah. The prophets foretold the promise of a coming Savior while Israel waited expectantly for the signs to be shown, believing that one day the Messiah would come. Hear the word of the Lord. Sorry, that wasn't in bold. That's not that wasn't your fault. <laughs> Micah 5 2. Here's a reading from the Old Testament. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the enemies invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders. Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Israel and cry to her that her warfare, it has ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. And a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places become plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The second Advent lighting is the angel's candle representing peace. This sentiment is echoed in the angel's joyous strain. Hear the word of the Lord. A reading from the New Testament, Luke 2, starting in verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he has pleased. And 
may goodwill extend to all mankind. Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the word of the Lord. The responsive reading, as usual, in the bold print, please read yourselves. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. Our Heavenly Father, as we are closing out the liturgical service for the Advent candle for week two, we are thankful for your words of prophecy, your words of hope, and your words of exaltation as we desire to exalt you. We are thankful that we are seeing Advent from the other end, that we were not waiting for you of those 400 years But as we continue to wait for your second coming, I pray that we would be found faithful in your sight as we are grafted in and desiring to know you and to do the things that you have called us to do. Heavenly Father, we cannot do it without you. We need your help. Pray that anything that causes us to stumble would be removed. Anything that gets in the way, even ourselves that it would be removed so that your glory would be received to the fullest extent. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I heard someone gasp at one point, uh, lighting these candles. Quick story, when uh, my wife and I got married back in 1994, we lit the unity candle and I told Holly, I said, when we light the unity candle, let's turn around and look at the audience because most people don't remember a thing about their wedding. So I said, "Let's, let's think about just spending the rest of that time, because they always play a long song during the unity candle, then you could just look around and look at the people and just kind of enjoy the moment. So we were. We were just looking around, looking at everyone, enjoying the people, and everyone was looking at us very strangely. And uh, then it became uh, ramped up to they were in a little bit of a shock and awe. And finally, we heard someone in the front row say, Holly's veil is about to catch on fire. She was right in front of the candle, and as she was moving her head, it was just... Moving back and forth. So I had visions of unity candle for some of there. I'm glad that um, everything's okay. Uh, so the opposite of shock and awe would be peace. So that's what we're going to focus on with our time that still remains today, focusing on the peace of God. It's not exactly this peace that we're talking about, but for us maybe to even have a piece of God's peace is certainly enough. The good news is we are promised all of his peace. So the only time that that breaks down is when we have pieces of ourselves that get in the way. So we'll try to keep uh, all the pieces of peace together. Peace is a very interesting word. I think it's, it's not really hard to define. It's just hard to really understand what it is God's trying to give to us. Uh, if you look around at Christmas decorations, you see the word peace everywhere spelled correctly, P-E-A-C-E. Um, it's on our Christmas production. Um, on the uh, windows of storefronts, they have it uh, painted on there. And uh, other places in your homes, I'm sure there's a lot of peace, several pieces of the word peace, uh, decorating your area. And so we love the word, but I bet if we ask someone to explain it, um, other than the the easy stuff, you know, maybe a little bit of tranquility, but what is God trying to accomplish in our lives as a result of peace? 
So uh, looked it up. Here's the definition that, that we could easily find online. Peace would be a state of tranquility or quiet, harmony. If you've watched uh, The Lion King, you would remember Hakuna Matata, which means no worries. I have no responsibilities. That's peace. Anybody retired in here today? You feel uh, a more peaceful probably than you did back when you had responsibility. Uh, nothing feels better than to um, just have, or, or maybe even just to sit next to a babbling brook. How many really appreciate the peacefulness of sitting out and hearing the water trickle along? Anybody then, other than me? Yes, I would, I would rather go hear that than the ocean. Some people enjoy the ocean and that's peaceful. That drives me crazy. So I would rather, I want the water to keep moving, not just keep coming back and forth. And the thing about the ocean, when you go in, it's like the waves are throwing you back out. They don't, the ocean doesn't even want you in there. It's throwing you back out. It's just not a great place to go. There's a lot of corrosive elements, sea, salt, sand. All those things are breaking you down. Go to the mountains. It's cold. You'll enjoy it. And uh, you'll find some babbling brooks, right? So this is peaceful. Um, another idea of peace, a picture of peace, would be uh, a hug. How many of you love hugs? Well, come here. <laughs> no, we'll hug later. But yeah, that's a, uh, that, that's a good feeling. When someone gives you a hug, confidence of care, support, uh, depending on what the situation is, uh, that can be a very peaceful feeling, a, a peaceful feeling that someone is supporting you and they're there for you. And um, with COVID, we probably hug a lot less. And so that's probably one of the uh, difficulties uh, during our time in, in regard to showing peace to one another, perhaps. And what about this? Laying down in your bed, being able to close your eyes and go to sleep. That's peaceful. How many of you don't do this very well? How many of you don't go to sleep very well? So there's, there's several of you here that have that problem. And that, I mean, you're just sitting there. Well, in fact, here, here's the opposite of each of these. I, I put a picture up contrasting what would not be peace. So you got this raft going down the rapids. That's no babbling brook. And that situation, although exhilarating for some, is not very peaceful, is it? Uh, the argument, instead of a hug, trying to uh, bear down on who's going to win and what the situation is. And then you have the poor lady here who's looking at, well, the clock to saying 3 a.m. And she's just laying there. And that is not peace. That's, that's frustrating. And there's a lot of reasons why, you know, these may happen uh, in each of our lives. Uh, medication, um, our own body propensity, uh, stress, which uh, anybody else deal with stress? So stress is a big one. And in God's economy, in God's kingdom, um, he has a very stress-free way of living life. But the problem is we still live in this earthly kingdom as well. And there's, there's a lot of stress. God's trying to move us away from that. We'll talk a little more about that later. But uh, so here are some pictures of, of peaceful situations and then the contrast for each. I want to read Luke 2, 9 through 14 uh, as we look at um, the ideas of peace. It says here, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. This is the Christmas story, right? And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. That's good. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in the manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom God is pleased. So the first thing I want to point out as we talk about peace is the angels having to declare, fear not. Do you know how many times the phrase, the command, fear not, appears in the Bible? A bunch. 365 times uh, under one translation. That's one for every day of the year, which is probably pretty helpful to us, uh, except maybe leap year, which might be a real stressful day. Anyway, I don't know. But um, fear not, that is a lot of commands. Why is God having to constantly tell us not to fear? 
because we are a fear, fearful bunch, right? And God is so amazing and does amazing things that are way beyond what we could imagine or suspect that when he does those things for us, it could be a little fearful. Or when he desires something from us that he wants that we are not prepared for, that could be very fearful. So the first thing he says is, is he's, you're his messenger, which is that's what an angel is. Uh, the Greek word is angelos, and, or angelos, actually, it's a hard G. Um, it's where we get our word angel, angelos, but it also means messenger. And so angels were often messengers. Uh, and today, you and I could be a messenger of God. Don't you like to speak for God? Yeah, <laughs> just make sure it comes from God, because if you're a false prophet, what happens to you? You get stoned. <laughs> So don't go around saying things that God did not really say. That could be big trouble. But constantly in all these situations that as God is dealing with us, he's having to tell us not to fear. Again, we should expect God to be amazing, wonderful, and very different than what we would expect. And that could cause fear. Have you ever read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah, it's about uh, accepting change in the workplace, which nobody really likes that, unless, what? You're the person making the change. <laughs> then you love it. Everyone else just is not really into that. So looking at the Christmas story, which we just read the, the main part of the Christmas story right here, there's not a lot of peace involved in it, which seems to be ironic, that God in the Christmas story is bringing everything together he is the Prince of Peace. He is coming on the scene. And amongst all of this is a very, well, a lot of unpeaceful situations. I mean, here you have a 14-year-old girl who's pregnant and nobody knows, nobody can see who the father is. Is that very peaceful? To walk around your village and people figuring that out and you're trying to explain, well, it's, it's God's baby. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense, okay. Um, of course, her husband had an appearance of an angel as well to help him to feel better about it. Uh, why was Mary and Joseph even heading to Bethlehem? A government census. Nobody likes those things. Uh, not to mention the fact that they had to travel. Uh, with my sister uh, living in Georgia and uh, with us doing a service in Georgia, we had to get to Georgia. We had to book rooms. Everything was last minute, um, which sometimes that's very frustrating, not very peaceful. And I'm still making phone calls trying to work out some of those details from some of them because they just, they didn't pay attention to me when we were talking about all this stuff at the hotel and all this stuff. So Mary and Joseph, they get a last minute hotel. Was it a peaceful situation? There was no room for them in the inn. Where did they finally find a room? Well, it wasn't a room. It was just a cave in a stable, which for them were caves, <laughs> Fortunately, they had a place to lay baby Jesus when he was born in a, in a manger, that's a, that's a euphemism, <laughs> in a cattle trough, <laughs> a messy, dirty, uh, hopefully they had some clean hay. Um, my point is that the whole story is riddled with unpeaceful situations, and yet God was in the midst of it bringing peace. That is a great analogy into each of our lives, not that we are the Christmas story, but as we go through our lives, just like God was in the midst of everything, bringing his peace in the midst of a very difficult situation, that's what we see in the Christmas story over and over and over. Okay, another part of the good news, uh, this helps on the peaceful side, is that a Savior is about to be born, and that Savior is Christ the Lord. He will be the one in charge. And so that's good news. He's coming. He's on our side. We have something to look forward to. And the angels end their decree with this statement, peace among those with whom he is pleased. You know, we don't talk a lot about that phrase when we talk about peace, that God brings peace. Do you, do you need peace? Are you having a hard time? God gives peace. Let me pray for you and let, let me extend God's peace. Let me say ahead of time, God has got peace for you. Let me just let you know and he'll give it to you. You just have to receive it. Have you heard that before? Something similar to that? Well, sure. But what, what's the prerequisite to getting peace? It's only for those with whom he is pleased. Well, that's bad news for most of us <laughs> because we do some stupid things, don't we? So right in the midst of the Christmas story, the angels are declaring, 
And they're saying that peace is coming, but only for those who God is pleased. So we're going to focus on this as we close out. Being pleasing to God, three things. Uh, the first, oh, by the way, a lot of people ask me if I make Mark Lanier's PowerPoints. I don't. He does. He's like a PowerPoint master. He puts those together and usually on the Sunday morning before class because that's where he gets his mind in the groove and starts working through. He already knows what he's going to teach, but when he puts his PowerPoint together, those are his notes and he's, he's organizing his thoughts. He puts all that together and he does it really fast. On the other side, he doesn't do my PowerPoints. I do mine, but I do steal all of his slides and just change them. So <laughs> much, much easier because uh, I've learned from the best. Thankful to Mark Lanier. So three things about being pleasing to God, and we'll close out. The first is about trust and faith in God. The second thing is bringing peace to others. And the third thing is prayer, when we're talking about being pleasing to God. Do you want to please God? Everyone in here probably would say a resounding yes. I definitely want to please God. I may not be able to when it comes down to the nitty gritty. I may not choose to, but deep in my heart, ultimately, I would really like to if I can work it out somehow is what most of us would say. So let's look at these uh, three. We'll start with the first one about being pleasing to God is trusting or having faith in God. Mark has taught several times about the word faith is Greek word pistis, which is also translated believe and trust. So the word pistis for like, for those who believe in God, believe is probably not the best translation of pistis. I think trust trumps it almost every time. A few instances it might work good. But instead of do you believe in God, the better question is do you trust God? Or you could say it in Greek, do you pistis God? Which you might get your face slapped if you say that to the wrong person. So let's just keep English. Do you trust God? What does that mean to trust God? Do you trust him to the point that you totally depend on him? Or in case God doesn't come through in a way that you want him to, have you set aside enough resources that you can still get stuff done? Most of us have some resources and we are willing to use them to get our agenda done if God doesn't come through for us. And with that agenda and with those resources, we try to let the things of the world grow strangely dim and use those for his glory, which is what he wants us to. But oftentimes we uh, take it the other way. So let's look at faith and trust. And I found a, a, a parable in God's word, Matthew 8, 23 through 27, that talks a little bit about peace in the life of the disciples. It's not a parable, I'm sorry. This is an account of what happened with Jesus and the disciples. Let's look through it real quick. And when he got into the boat, that's Jesus, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. So the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he, Jesus, was asleep. Remember one of the pictures of peace? Jesus is at peace. He's in the bottom of the boat. He is asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why? Are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? What he was saying is, you don't trust me yet, do you? Because if you did, and I'm here sleeping, what have you got to worry about? I mean, seriously, the Son of God is in the boat. God's not going to take that boat out and wipe them all out because Jesus is in the boat. So it's really good news if Jesus is with you, if Jesus lives in you, he's not going to wipe you out just randomly, because God's with you. It reminds me of a time, do y'all know who Louis Giglio is? I knew Louis from Choice Bible Study. Oh, there we are. We're so young. If you know Louis, he's got, oops, he's all gray, white, white, gray, white-headed. And uh, I was at a conference at Prestonwood Baptist Church back in the or mid-90s, I think, maybe it was before that. And uh, anyway, he was speaking at a conference. We, don't, we didn't like know each other like we're not buddies, but we were together for a second and someone took that picture. And so now I've got it immortalized right here for us. But um, Louis taught the Choice Bible Study in Waco, and that's where I went to school in at Baylor, uh, which, by the way, Sikkim Bears did a great job uh, winning the championship game last, uh, last yesterday. And so I 
was at Baylor and went to his choice Bible study, which really was an amazing Bible study. It was every Monday night, two hours, about an hour of songs and an hour of teaching, and uh, it was life-changing. There was several things in my spiritual life that I gained. So I always attributed to Louis that he was one of my mentors, even though he does not know it. <laughs> one day I might tell him. Anyway, um, I was also a summer youth minister down in Pearsall, Texas. Y'all know where that is? Down south of San Antonio in Pearsall. Uh, they named the town because they said they, someone looked out, all they saw was the prickly pear or cactus. And they said, what do you see? And he said, Pearsall. So that's how it got its name, Pearsall, Texas. Um, First Baptist Church, Pearsall. I was the summer youth minister through uh, my, after my sophomore year at Baylor. And then starting, I went back to school at Baylor. And for that next fall semester and the spring semester, they flew me into Pearsall, which you had to go through San Antonio and then drive an hour, once a month from Waco just to add consistency to their youth program. And I was the summer youth minister again after my junior year high school. It was some of the best ministry years of my life. So every month I got to fly out of Waco Regional Airport down to San Antonio and then drive to Pearsall. So one day I was getting there in the airport and it's very small, it's easy to get around and whatever. Um, I was sitting there getting on a flight and we always had to fly through Dallas. So we go to Waco to Dallas to San Antonio. I uh, look over and there's Louis Giglio. And it's, it's early in the morning. Uh, he, he had his Bible open. He's sitting there and the, there, no one else is around him. Uh, I just figure he's having his quiet time. So he's sitting there and the next thing I know he starts doing this. He's looking down his Bible and he's doing this. So I start doing this, thinking I'm tapping into some spiritual aura that's going on in the room. I didn't know. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing out on anything. So anyway, um, came time for the board the plane. I, I never felt anything weird or something. We, we were getting on the plane and we had to line up and walk outside and go up those stairs. You know, you've seen that on TV. Uh, it was a new experience for me. And in this particular time, I had sprained my ankle. And so I was on crutches and I was hobbling along. And so we were standing next to each other and he said to me, and he doesn't know me from Adam, he says, uh, how are you doing? Uh, what happened to your foot? And I said, oh, I sprained the devil out of it. And then I was like, oh, I just said devil to Louis Giglio. Are you supposed to do that? So we got on the plane. We flew to Dallas and, on the, and, and went through the whole trip. Then I went on to San Antonio, did the, uh, my Saturday, Sunday flew back into Dallas, and then on the Dallas trip back to Waco, Louis Giglio was on my plane, and it was a bumpy ride. I mean, it was the worst, one of those little prop jet things, worst that I'd ever ridden, and all I could think of, God, you are not going to take Louis Giglio out, so I know that I am safe. <laughs> I'm sure the disciples missed that little bit, that Jesus Christ is on the, or is in the boat that they have nothing to fear, but they're freaking out. And so as they freak out, they, they tell Jesus, save us. We, we need to be saved. So what does Jesus do? He's, first, he, he scolds them. He says, you have little faith. You don't trust me. And that's why you don't have peace. If you trusted me, even in the storms, you would still have peace. And then what did he do? He said, peace, be still. And he quieted the storm. And they were like, wow. Even in this, even in this, situation, the, the weather and nature even are under his authority, which was uh, insightful for the disciples. And so we benefit from reading about that. Okay, now another point in Romans 8, 5 through 8, as I'm moving along through this area of having faith and trust in God in order to have his peace and to be pleasing to God. It says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. It's important to note. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and its peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the, in the flesh cannot please God. So we should walk by faith and not by sight in order to have peace with God. We cannot rely on and put our stock in or our eggs in the basket of what goes on in this world. We have to transfer to a different worldview and be a part of a different kingdom that God is explaining constantly about what is the kingdom of God. In fact, all through the, the Gospels, you hear Jesus telling story, parable after parable, modeling situation after situation. Even in the, the, the negative 
difficult times that he's sparring against the Pharisees and the scribes, others who are trying to trick him. He is constantly in every situation teaching about what it means to be a citizen in God's kingdom and not the kingdom of Caesar in their, sense, in their situation of the American government in our situation and whatever government that those of you who are watching online that you're a part of, even though governments can be very beneficial, they can also be very unbeneficial, right? We can see the pros and the cons. I mean, when I got on the road yesterday and I had to drive down to Magnolia, I got on a highway with uh, it was a tow road. It was wide open and I could just, cru- there were no police officers, no one standing in my way. It was just me cruising along. That's because the government takes my money and they build these roads, which I'm very thankful for. I love roads. I love to drive on roads and I love to drive fast on roads. <laughs> the point is, the government makes some of those things happen. And in order to do that, what do they take? Tax. So do I feel bad about giving to the government tax? I shouldn't. Do you feel bad about it? You shouldn't. And why? Because they're doing a lot of good things, but you're also thinking about all the bad things. And you're like, I can't believe I'm giving my money to them and they're doing it this and this and this. They sh- and then the other side is saying, well, I'm glad they're doing this, this, and this. I can't believe they're doing this, this, and this. Secret It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because what did Jesus, who's teaching about living in the kingdom of God while staying on the world's kingdom, what did he say about tax? Why can't we do that? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, meaning everything else. Everything else goes to God. Why can't we just get that? When you, when you pay your taxes, and no matter how much they are and how much they appraise your house for, pay your taxes. And it's not your responsibility what your government does because you don't live in that kingdom. You live in a different kingdom that Jesus is trying to explain. And that's why he told the people, yeah, give to Caesar whatever is Caesar's, whatever he wants. It doesn't matter. I'm God. I've got absolutely everything. And my people will give what they need to give to my purposes and we will live great in the kingdom of God. And one day we won't even need any of the finances, the stuff that we have to go through now. Give to the kingdom, give to the government, whatever it is that they want. And what if they pass bad laws? Good news, we just had a Roe v. Wade uh, Supreme Court looking at that law, possibly to overturn it, which I think is great. But I also know that you cannot legislate morality. You know, that doesn't work. It's good that we have laws against bad things. I appreciate that. And the government's a part of that. Um, And there's also laws about other things that I don't necessarily agree with. But I don't care. Because as long as I'm going to live here in this world, I'm going to do what for my government? I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to give them my tithes. Not tithes. (laughs) Shouldn't give them that. I'll give them my tithes, but not my offerings. Don't offer anything. No, I'll give them my tax but not my offerings. Uh, Tithe is not a New Testament principle. We're not talking about uh, tithing today, but there's no tithing in the New Testament. But we do give grace gifts. We give what we agreed with God and we're a joyful giver. That's how we give to God. Government is another thing. But I'm gonna walk by faith and not by sight. I'm gonna trust Jesus when he said, give to Caesar what Caesar's and I'm gonna give God everything else He's going to give me some to live on, and I hope I'm discerning enough to be able to choose how to use my money wisely that I have for the kingdom of God because the things that I want, Christmas is coming up. Who wants some stuff? The stuff that I want just doesn't matter as much. So just be careful. We're heading into Christmas. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So here again is where the government will rest on his shoulders. His government, the true government, the one that matters, the kingdom of God. So when Jesus was on earth, he told the parables and the situations. Every time he said, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. When you're living in the kingdom of God, do this. In the kingdom of God, don't do this, this, and this, but do this and this and help here and hope there. He did that through his three and a half year ministry. And then after he died on the cross, he, was, he rose, he appeared before several, but before he ascended 
to heaven, he met with the disciples in the upper room. Do you remember that? He met with the disciples, and if you read Acts chapter 1, what did Jesus say that he was teaching them? It just summarizes it. It says, about the kingdom of God. He spent another 40 days rehashing. In other words, disciples, when I was telling you all this stuff earlier, you were just kind of taking me half and half. Now that I've died and rose again, you're probably paying more attention. So I'm going to go through all this stuff again in a crash course, 40 days. This is the kingdom of God. And this is the way you're supposed to be living your life. And you don't have to worry about Caesar other than just go along to get along in regard to what you have to do and responsibility. But if it conflicts with anything that I tell you to do, my kingdom overcomes any other kingdom in the world. And you know what? A lot of people, including the disciples, have lost their lives to governments who didn't agree with their priority of kingdoms. How many of us have been persecuted because our faith in doing what we know God's called us to do, even though our government perhaps says that we shouldn't or can't do it in a certain way or a certain place or a certain thing? God's kingdom always triumphs. Remember, the government is the prophecy will rest upon Jesus' shoulders. He is in charge of how you behave and how you act. So in whose government do you reside? Whose government do you reside? The kingdom of God is the right answer. So the second thing, being pleasing to God, you have to have trust and faith in God. You have to accept him as your personal savior. That's trusting him. And then the second thing is you need to bring peace to others. How do I know that? Jesus, one of his best famous sermons on the mount, he says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Be peacemakers. We should be giving peace to other people. I have kind of a kuna matata attitude. I'm, I'm a generally laid back. You can ask my wife. She would, are you, there she is. Hi, Holly. Am, am I kind of laid back? Are you the opposite of me? Less laid back. <laughs> She takes care of the details in the organization. I just tell me when to be there. Pick out my clothes so I know what to wear. I want to, I want to do everything right, but I don't want to actually do it. I just want to participate. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just hanging out. But she'll tell you that I've got a few pet peeves, things that really matter to me. And the, the people that are laid back, you know, that are like, hey, whatever. When we care about something, we put a lot of eggs in that basket. We really care about that. So some things that I shouldn't, but spiritual things are what we should care about. And as I'm giving peace to other people, if they've wronged me, do I need to hold a grudge? Oh, it feels so good to though. It makes me feel peaceful and better. If I just hold a grudge and I think of ways I can get back at them, I really do. I think of things that I can do to get back at them. And in my mind, it's like this video game that I'm playing. But in real life, I'm like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> I hate you, but <laughs> I'm smiling. Now, that's a hypocrite. Sometimes we have to be a little hypocritical while we are working through. My point is that we need to be at peace with one another. I mean, y'all may know a lawyer that's in town. You know, he's taking people to court and he's suing them. What does the Bible say about when your brother has a case against you, settle it out of court. I don't want to be in the courtroom with Mark Lanier on the other side. Just settle it out of court. That's easy, right? Even if it wasn't Mark, what if it's the worst lawyer ever? And you, my lawyer could beat your lawyer. You could beat you up and his dad could beat your dad up too. But Jesus says, settle it out of court. Make just set that aside. Get it straight, straightened out because it's getting in the way of spiritual things. How many of you are dealing with unpeaceful situations and relationships with other people that are close to you, that are acquaintances with you, that are total strangers with you, and you're just mad at them? You probably watch some TV shows and you see those news anchors and, what, and you just get so mad at people you don't even know. It's not worth it. Now, if they're doing something that's wrong, we're going to pray that God would be, bring justice because God is the ultimate justice. And in the kingdom of God, there is justice. And it is right justice, but it is on God's timetable. And it's not our timetable. So all I know is when I'm saying, hey, how are you doing? You don't like me very much, but uh, hi. I know that God's going to give you what you deserve one day. The problem is God's already forgiven them because they've asked for it and now they're in the kingdom of God. And isn't that a better story? 
Isn't that a better story than me getting back at them? As people to be pleasing to God, you got to have faith and trust in God. The second thing is you have got to be a peacemaker. The other day, okay, I was riding my bike. I love to ride my bike. I came around and the, the, the traffic was backed up on the service road near uh, two, uh, uh, 249 and Jones Road. There was a car that was broken down. It has flashers on. And then the people were sitting in a car behind it with their flashers on waiting for someone to come to help. I got off my bike. I went over to him and I said, hey, could I help you push this car out of the way because all these cars are backing up? See, that's an unpeaceful situation. I wanted to be a peacemaker. Can I help you? I want to push this at... I want to push this out of the way just over to the side. There's a spot we could push it. And then everyone could go because in traffic, I hate to be stopped. I hate for other people to be stopped. So I wanted to be a peacemaker. It's kind of, that's not a very spiritual thing, but that's just what I want to do. Every situation. And the guy's like, uh, they're going to be here in two minutes. Uh, I don't want to do that. Okay. I don't want to you know, cause problems with him. Like, give me your keys. I'm just going to put it in neutral. Give me a second. I was at peace with him, got back on my bike and went on my way. I just said, hey, I'm trying to help. And he said, hey, I appreciate that. Okay. So we're good. Be a peacemaker. That's my point. Uh, Matthew, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. We're supposed to go. This is how you make peace. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Share the gospel with them. In fact, it's a command for all of us. All of us should be peacemakers. All of us should be disciple makers. And the last thing in Ezra 7.10, you want an Old Testament reference real quick. Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach God's statutes and rules in Israel. What if we had that gumption? That we wanted to study what God's word said. Not just come to church and hear someone talk about it, but dive down and study it and then do it. Live it out. Live in that kingdom of God and then teach it to someone else so they would at least have the privilege of knowing how to live life better with peace. Last thing, it's prayer. This is quick because it's probably the most famous prayer verse in the Bible, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it will guard, guard, guard. Serious word here. Roman infantry, it's talking about something they're familiar with, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, Paul concludes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That is a road to peace. The first step is pray about it. And you realize, you know, when we go to God and we pray, we tell him all the things that we want fixed. (laughs) We want him to get to work. And God's looking at us going, I thought I wanted you to work for me. We got it backwards. But while we're giving God all of our desires and wants, and, you know, if you could fix this and help that, I would be at peace. God rarely fixes those things. But what does he promise? Peace that you don't understand. Peace that's beyond understanding. If God fixed all your problems, the peace would be easily understood. Does that make sense? If you prayed, you know, I've, I've got a limp and my, hurt, my foot hurts. God, could you just heal it real quick? Oh, thank you. Now I can walk. Okay, I've got peace, but it's because God fixed my problem. That's understandable. I get that. But if I'm still limping around, and God gives me peace amidst the struggle, that's what he's talking about. That's what the promise is. It's not that God's going to fix all of your problems if you get enough people praying for you, and you pray enough, and you ask not, get not, and all that stuff. That's not what the point is. The point is this. In the midst of your struggle that God probably allowed you to have in the first place because he is sovereign in control, that he's trying to teach you something or maybe teach somebody else something, and I'm like, please hurry and teach them so I can get my foot feel better. But in the midst of it, I can have peace because what do I know? I know that in the kingdom of God, God is at work in everything. Even the things that God doesn't want and and it says allowed to happen. He doesn't want that. That's evil and bad and, and cruel and terrible. I know that God is at work and that he will give me his peace. And it makes sense that I don't understand it because that's crazy that I would feel peaceful in a situation That does not make sense.
So we're in for a prayer revolution. We need to be praying better and have a great understanding of the kingdom of God. That is Advent week two. So your light for today, three things in review very easily. Trust in God. Be yourself a peacemaker. Go out of your way to make peace. In fact, this week, your assignment, find someone that you are not at peace with, maybe because of a 10-year struggle or because they make you mad in the cashier line when you go to the store, and make peace with them. Last thing, uh, pray, which is really talk and listen to God. Don't just tell God all your problems. Talk and listen. Have a conversation with God. He promises peace in your life because he begins to align your life with his will in his kingdom and now all of a sudden it makes sense and you don't care about the kingdom of the world our heavenly father as we close out today we are thankful for your peace so we celebrate today the second week of advent the second advent candle peace of god and heavenly father we know you don't promise just a piece of it but you promise us a whole complete your peace that satisfies. It's just what we need in a time of trouble or a time of joy. And we have enough of it that we can give to somebody else. God, help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.